Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to part two of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the air war, day one. And yeah, we're just going to jump straight back into it. I've done the reaction to like the day before this, like two days ago. I say the day before this, what was it titled? Um, wait, the ground war day one, the air war. Okay, so yeah, this is the air war. I've done the ground war. But yeah, we're going to jump into this and learn more about this war and yeah that's pretty much it let's jump into this links are in the description in the description to my patreon where you can see reactions to videos that i can't post to youtube always oh, hit 1 million subs let's go man a little celebration you love to see it but yeah let's jump into this and just see what happened during day one of the air war i wanted to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for your support over the last four years we've grown into an international team of 15 people we have loved producing battle map animations for you and we love hearing how much you enjoy them. Let's go, man. We do our absolute best to offer accurate and unbiased recreations of the most important battles and operations of the 20th and 21st centuries. I hope we've done a relatively good job at this. Yes, However, sir. you may have also been following the recent changes in YouTube monetization rules that is often demonetizing our videos. With a team of people relying on this monetization, this has become a major challenge for us. Shorts now take up valuable space on the YouTube homepage that would ordinarily be used to recommend our long-form content. We are also censored from covering certain topics. As just one example, certain conflicts involving certain, um, militant groups in certain Middle Eastern places over the last 20 years get demonetized, preventing us from covering major events in recent military history. When videos are demonetized, it's YouTube policy to specifically not tell us the reason, in case we don't do that thing again, or something. With that in mind, this video is sponsored by our new and updated Patreon. We've got Let's lots go, of man. exciting new benefits, and are creating a community where we can interact with you more directly. We're uploading all videos completely ad and sponsor free. We've launched a new Q&A series on the Intel Report, where Patreons can directly ask the follow-up questions to the operations room on the Intel Report videos. We'll be featuring your reactions and comments to early releases on the videos themselves when they later upload to YouTube. You'll also gain access to Patreon-only events, competitions, and giveaways. We'll continue to commit to our YouTube release schedule as is, but we will also be able to release videos on censored topics and videos that have been demonetized on Patreon. Absolutely no pressure at all, but if you would like to support us... Well, there you go. If you're interested, that's something... For, like, as a lot of people would definitely be interested in this because it's the same content, you just get it on Patreon. It would be amazing. Please take a look at the link in the description and pinned comment below. No problem at all if not, we appreciate all of your support since April 2019. Come on. 14 B-52H Stratofortress strategic bombers begin rolling down the runway at RAF Fairford in the United Kingdom at just before 1pm local time on the 21st of March 2003. The crews of the aircraft queuing on the taxiway wave small American flags out their windows before joining the main runway drawing cheers from the ground crews. The B-52s are on their way to their target, Baghdad. There, they will join coalition aircraft to bring shock and awe to Saddam Hussein's military. Four B-2 Spirit stealth bombers and a further 14 B-52s also take off from the British base at Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Like the B-52s flying from the UK, these aircraft are en route to the operational area. Aboard the aircraft carrier USS Constellation, Captain Mark Fox has briefed the pilots of Carrier Wing 2, whose 20 F-A-18C Hornet strike aircraft are part of the first wave heading to Baghdad. Due to press reporters listening in on the briefings, Fox and his subordinates are careful not to disclose sensitive information, while also giving their men a clear picture of what to expect before sending them to their aircraft. The liftoff from the carrier's flight deck is smooth, and the Hornets climb to 18,000 feet en route to meet their tankers over northern Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, strike aircraft, strategic bombers, wild weasels, tankers, electronic warfare aircraft, recon aircraft and drones begin launching from air bases across the Middle East and from five aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf. By the end of the first day, 1,700 sorties will have been launched against Iraq, about 60% of the number during the first day of the air war of Desert Storm. The first so wave is to launch. They've a gone lighter for this for sure, probably because they saw how that went and they thought, okay, we can we don't have to put as much into this in the sense of as many aircraft and 
people and just everything in general to come and also they he mentioned in day one of the ground war that they were putting a lot of the focus on like the new technology so i guess like drones and stuff right coordinated attack into baghdad at 9 p.m local time h hour hundreds of strike aircraft will then immediately join the aerial assault across iraq hitting iraqi army and republican guard targets sam sites and military infrastructure this operation was originally intended to mark the official start of Operation Iraqi Freedom, with the ground invasion following on the morning of the 22nd. Instead, US 5th Corps and the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force have crossed the Iraqi border 24 hours early, after concern that Saddam Hussein's government would wage a scorched earth campaign. Saddam's generals are caught off guard by this strategy. They had been expecting another long and sustained aerial barrage similar to the one they had faced in the five weeks before the land offensive of Operation Desert Storm. With the Iraqi military knocked back on its heels, the leader of Central Command, General Tommy Franks, and the Air War Commander, Major General Buzz Mosley, decide to proceed with the first day of the planned air offensive, A-Day. The objective is to clear out enemy air defences and decisively cripple the Ba'athist regime. Unlike at the beginning of Desert Storm, the coalition has already won air superiority over Iraq, with months of preparatory airstrikes. When planning for Iraqi freedom began, General Mosley estimated that his air forces would need 10 to 14 days to pummel Saddam's air defences before the invasion could start. General Franks was unhappy with this. He believed the lightning war on the ground should be supported by a lightning war in the sky. Instead, Operation Southern Focus was authorised in 2002. Royal Air Force and United States Air Force aircraft methodically bomb Iraqi air defences over the no-fly zone below the 33rd parallel. Between March and December 2002, the number of bombs dropped by the RAF and USAF on Iraq increased by 300%. Jeez. The suppression missions became so routine that RAF tornado pilots began referring to them as recreational bombing. Creation. However, not all enemy air defences have been suppressed. The air defences in the area of central Iraq did not fall under either the northern or southern no-fly zones established during Desert Storm, and have not been targeted by inter-war strikes. Coalition intelligence has identified over 200 threats within this area, including Soviet-built SA-2, SA-3 and SA-6 launchers. French-made Rolands, and even an American-produced Hawk SAM battery, which Damn. was captured by the Iraqi army during the invasion of Kuwait in 1991. A main objective for Air War Commander General Mosley will be the elimination of AA capability in this area, which has been named the Super Missile Engagement Zone, or Super Mes. While the strike aircraft are assembling, General Franks addresses his subordinates by video call from his headquarters in Qatar, telling them, Shock will be introduced at 2100. You're all doing great. At General Mosley's command post in Saudi Arabia and aboard the US Navy carriers in the Persian Gulf, air controllers are closely monitoring the strike groups. The mission planners have created three dimensional highways in the sky to minimize any mid air collisions or friendly fire. What a way to put it. <laughs> highways in the air. Let's just go to show how many there really were. These highways require incoming aircraft to fly on the right-hand side. Wow, that is crazy. So they were literally treating it like that. While egressing aircraft fly to the left. These paths are to be strictly followed by the aviators as they fly into enemy airspace. It makes sense. It's just fascinating. An aerial innovation will help the coalition improve over its performance from Desert Storm. Both the United States and United Kingdom have since built fleets of UAVs which can provide valuable intelligence without putting their operators in danger. A year earlier, the US Air Force unsuccessfully attempted to shoot down an Iraqi MiG-25 using a Predator drone, but the episode spooked Iraqi High Command into ceasing aerial patrols. In preparation for A-Day, unarmed Predator drones have been loitering above Baghdad to document enemy air defences. At just before 9pm, Navy Special Mission C-130s hmm. drop three Fire B target drones and peel away while the drones continue on a predictable heading towards Baghdad. These drones are to act as decoys and draw the attention of Iraqi air defences away from the incoming raids. <coughs> Arriving on station simultaneously, the B-52s from the UK and from Diego Garcia 
fulfil a similar task to their first actions during Desert Storm. The Stratofortresses launch 100 AGM 86C cruise missiles from Jeez. both the northwest and southeast of Iraq, Look at them the largest air launched cruise missile attack in history. The Stratofortresses turned for home, while the US Navy warships in the Persian Gulf launch Tomahawk missiles. A Day will see 504 cruise missile strikes against regime targets. The first strike on Baghdad will come in three waves and attack over 100 targets in the capital. While the Fire B target drones distract the anti-aircraft batteries around the city, the cruise missiles will strike Ba'athist targets and Republican Guard command posts to further draw Iraqi anti-aircraft fire. They will then be followed by 12 F-117 Nighthawks, supported by 10 EA-6B Prowlers, which will jam enemy radars. If the Prowlers detect Iraqi fire control radars, Eight F-16 CJ Wild Weasels will be vectored to destroy the enemy with radar-seeking harm missiles. Four B-2 Stealth Bombers, 20 FA-18s, eight F-14s and eight F-15Es will follow in to hit targets in the city after the Iraqi- Wow, so after those missiles, they're following up with a lot more- Air defences have been exhausted. Immediately following the initial attack in Baghdad, Hundreds of strike aircraft will execute their planned missions to attack military installations across the country. The B-1B Lancers will act as so-called roving linebackers, patrolling Iraqi airspace and awaiting the order to unleash their munitions on targets of opportunity. More airstrikes by RAF Tornadoes and B-1Bs will simultaneously target what remains of Iraq's air force and SAM capabilities around the Supermed. Altogether, the A-Day strike aircraft will carry out more than 1,700 sorties against Saddam's regime. The they're approaching, and they're approaching from two angles as well, or two sides, Jesus. Fire-B target drones launched earlier arrive over Baghdad and have their intended effect. Iraqi radar teams take the bait and switch on their radar sets to lock onto the drones. <coughs> Anti-aircraft fire erupts wildly into the night sky. This is the night Once the as drones well. are within the city limits, they release aluminium chaff strips, scrambling Iraqi radar sets even further. Oh wow. At exactly 9pm, H hour, the first AGMs and Tomahawks scream into Baghdad. Just as planned, the Iraqi defenders open fire with all the weapons at their disposal. Like in 1991, news organisations have trained their cameras on the city and broadcast the opening salvo of the air offensive live to the world. Oh, there's footage of it. This Shit. time, none of the bridges over the Euphrates or Tigris rivers are bombed, as the American forces will soon need these crossings in their drive northwest. With new intelligence on the dire state of Iraqi infrastructure, electricity and water systems will also be spared. Thus, those watching at home are treated to the strange sight of downtown Baghdad being hit by cruise missiles while the city is still fully lit. Oh wow. The night that before, the Bush administration removes over 500 targets from the strike list, worried that Saddam's government might collapse too quickly and leave the country in anarchy. While the cruise missiles are pummeling Baghdad, the F-117s have encountered a problem. Because of the large number of aircraft involved in the operation, all KC-10, KC-130 and KC-135 tankers are swamped by refuelling missions, and nine of the twelve Nighthawks have been unable to tank on schedule. Oh wow. Only the three remaining F-117s have continued to Baghdad. Once the city is in sight, they split up and prepare to execute their attack runs from different directions to dilute enemy AA fire. Colonel Matthew McKeon, Major Stephen Ankerstar and Captain Brent Blake Seek out their targets. Ankerstar is flying in from the northeast and locates his first target, an Iraqi army communications array to the north of Baghdad. At 9.17pm, he drops a single bomb on the complex which detonates right on target. The F-117 continues south to the city itself, which is now covered in smoke following the cruise missile strikes. He then drops a GBU-27 earth-penetrating bomb on a four-way intersection, rumoured to have a military tunnel running beneath it. He egresses south as his aircraft avoids inaccurate anti-aircraft fire and SAM launches. The once-vaunted air defences around the Iraqi capital do not score a single hit. 
Colonel wow. McKeon spots his target, Not one. the massive dome of the Bath Party National Headquarters. He drops a single £2,000 bomb, which penetrates the building and explodes, collapsing the dome. McKeon heads north and drops another bomb on the same communications array Anchor Star struck earlier, before turning for home. Finally, Captain Blake drops both his bombs on another regime target in downtown Baghdad, before also turning south. Obliging General Frank's order that the air forces should keep the heat on, the B-2 Spirit stealth bombers arrive to continue the... Wow, they just come with more flipping hell. And this is all, again, this is all going to be, like, recorded, right? ...barrage as the F-117s are departing. The stealth bombers quickly get to work. A B-2 drops two 4,700-pound GBU-37 satellite-guided bunker busters on an Iraqi communications tower. The base of the tower explodes in a massive fireball, and the entire structure collapses. The B-2 can carry up to 16 JDAM precision-guided bombs, 16 JSAL glide bombs, or 8 GBU-37 bunker buster bombs. All of these weapons are deployed on this night. Saddam's lavish palaces in the Iraqi capital are systematically reduced to rubble by the B-2s. God damn. At 11pm local time, the remaining conventional strike fighters in the Baghdad force move in to hit their targets. It is also at There's this more. Oh jeez, it's just non-stop. Time that the conventional strike fighters and strategic bombers that are now flooding into Iraq to hit military targets across the country also begin their mass assault. With Iraqi military command isolated and in chaos, the F-16 CJ Vipers begin the dirty work of suppression of enemy air defenses or SEED. SEED missions are among the most demanding faced by pilots. Known as wild weasels, the SEED aircraft must fly in close coordination with the strike aircraft and remain constantly vigilant in monitoring enemy radar activity. Yeah, being a pilot in general has got to be somewhat hard, like just a general pilot, commercial pilot, then a pilot in the military, in action, in these, in these aircraft that are <laughs> a different level to what we can really imagine, right? They're fast, they can manoeuvre, like they've got all these things they have to do all these objectives and then doing this in this sort of situation i cannot imagine how hard and demanding that must be these exhausting flights can last anywhere between six to twelve hours oh. and require as many as 10 mid-air refuelings to remain on station over the area of operations what however the united states air force employs the most modern seed tactics along with the feared harm missiles once an enemy radar set is detected the F-16s engage the target with harms, missiles which lock onto the radar emissions themselves. With Iraqi radar sites continuing to try to illuminate American aircraft over Baghdad, the environment is target-rich for the F-16s. One wild weasel pilot later brags, the Iraqis knew for sure that if they came on the air, they were going to get a face full of harm. With the skies clear of enemy aircraft, and the Vipers destroying any Iraqi radar that illuminates, Captain Fox leads a flight of four F-A-18s to their target, an enemy surface-to-surface -surface missile site just outside Baghdad's southern suburbs. There's more. While en route to the objective, Fox watches the aerial fireworks from the cockpit of his Hornet as SAM and tracer rounds arc through the night sky above the city, which is still fully lit. He later recalled, Baghdad's light and the building crescendo of explosions were almost too bright to view through night vision goggles. What the fuck? Each Hornet in the flight is carrying three AGM-154 Joint Standoff Weapons, or JSALs. These fire-and-forget glide bombs are the perfect weapon to knock out the Iraqi missiles. When the four Hornets reach the JSAL launch point, each AGM-154 releases from the underside of the aircraft with a thunk sound. Guided by sophisticated avionics using GPS tracking, the JSALs glide towards their targets. Within a minute, all 12 explode and demolish the missile launchers. The Hornets bank to the right as Captain Fox is treated to a unique sight. Below him, he spots a sea of sparkles, almost as if there are people taking flash photographs from the ground. He realises that it is actually hundreds of Iraqi soldiers firing AKs straight up into the air at his aircraft. Fox later remarks, I thought to myself, this would be a bad night to go low. As the flight egresses south, he looks back one more time to take in the spectacle of the air campaign. <laughs> the Iraqi defences were spectacular, but ineffective. 
another flight of four Hornets, including two from Marine Squadron 323 There's from the USS more. Constellation, Flipping are out. about to reach their targets in the town of Karbala. However, this mission is facing difficulty, as the four Vipers tasked with defending the Hornets are late. Commander Mark Hubbard and the rest of the flight are circling to wait for them, when he also learns that the Prowler electronic jamming aircraft is also missing. Running out of fuel, Hubbard knows he must abort if his support aircraft cannot arrive on time. Yet, with less than two minutes to spare, the Vipers arrive and Hubbard gives the go-ahead to continue the mission. Wow. Two Marine Hornets split off to bomb a communications array just is, to the west. This is where it's going to go a bit left because of the situation. Hubbard and his wingman head for their target, a barracks complex in Karbala, which is a training complex for Saddam Hussein's personal bodyguards. Ribbons of Iraqi anti-aircraft tracers lace through the sky and bracket the two Hornets, who continue undeterred. At the release point, they each drop 2,000 pound JDAMs before turning for the Persian Gulf. Their munitions explode right on target. Despite the heavy AA fire, none of the Hornets in the flight have taken any battle damage. Oh wow. Meanwhile, Damn, the RAF tornadoes join the fray. Four oh, tornado yeah. GR4s of 9 Squadron are screaming towards the Iraqi city of Al Kut on a seed mission. Flight Lieutenant Andy Robbins and his weapon system officer, Lieutenant Dave Williams, are the second aircraft in the formation. Each tornado is carrying a single AIM-9L Sidewinder, a chaff countermeasure pod, 600 gallon drop tanks, and five alarm anti-radar missiles. Robbins and Williams receive a warning telling them that their aircraft's avionics cooling system has failed, oh, followed no. quickly by another informing the men that the radar homing and warning receiver has also malfunctioned. Despite the cascading failures, Robbins closes up to the lead. He's just going to it still. Do you reckon that's just because that's just basically it's just sort of what they're told to do or do you reckon they are just fear they obviously are fearless right but in this situation they're like you know what fuck it we're just gonna go for it still we're on this mission we're gonna get it done even if there's a higher risk that it's gonna go wrong for us or again at the same time like i've just asked is it more the objective and like fear of failing to do what they've done it's probably a mixture of both right but i mean if they're if their aircraft is still functioning at this point, maybe they're just sort of thinking it's still going to be okay. ...lead aircraft to effectively share their warning receiver. They detect a Roland SAM fire control radar set lighting up to search for targets, and the tornado achieves lock with the alarm missiles. Four of the five missiles launch while the aircraft egresses south. The alarms smash the radar and there is little anti-aircraft fire. Damn. As they return to base... Robbins is in awe of the columns of coalition ground forces below them, advancing north. He watches them through his night vision goggles and later recalls, every road into Iraq was simply rammed with green dots. Wow. At the same time, two pairs of tornadoes from 617 Squadron are about to showcase their MBDA Storm Shadow cruise missiles for the first time. An Anglo-French bunker-busting cruise missile the Storm Shadow can be air-launched by tornadoes, delivering 450 kilograms of high-explosive warheads up to 350 miles, and through the roofs of hardened aircraft shelters and bunkers. Nine Squadron, the same unit which sank the German battleship Tirpitz with 617 Squadron 60 years earlier, launched their missiles at hardened Iraqi Air Defense Command bunkers in Taji and Tikrit. They follow with alarm missiles against radar sites across the country. The B-1B Lancer strategic bombers orbit the airspace, each aircraft armed with a payload of 24 JDAMs. When given the signal by the air controllers, the Lancers pounce on targets of opportunity. The supersonic bombers face little to no anti-aircraft fire. However, they do not hit many Iraqi aircraft, which are conspicuously absent from their airfields. It is later discovered that the Iraqis buried much of their remaining MiGs and Mirages in the desert to keep them from being destroyed in the initial attack. Oh, damn. This is also because Saddam believes the coalition will fail to depose him, and he hopes to reactivate his air force once they have withdrawn. Four F-15E Strike Eagles from the 336th Tactical Fighter Squadron are tasked with dealing a personal blow to the Iraqi dictator. Nicknamed the Rocketeers, the Strike Eagles are approaching Baghdad to attack Saddam Hussein's Yacht Club. 
At the same time, four Strike Eagles from the 335th Tactical Fighter Squadron, the Chiefs, are en route to destroy the Republican Guard barracks at Saddam International Airport. These attacks are intended to make it harder for Saddam to flee the country before he can be captured. However, the mission is already not going according to plan. One of the 335th Strike Eagles suffered an air-to-ground missile failure while still on the ground, leaving only three to complete the mission. When the F-15Es are in range of the airport, another one of the AGMs fails to launch. Two of the Strike Eagles manage to launch their missiles, but one explodes only seconds after leaving the aircraft. Oh god. Only one AGM-130 impacts the target, but causes only minor damage. The well, Rocketeers fare even worse. None of the AGM missiles hit the Yacht Club due to a data link problem. The failure of these missions will lead to increased scrutiny of the AGM-130, which has gained a reputation for being unreliable. Not that Saddam's yacht collection will mind. <laughs> Fair enough. Two F-14D Tomcats of VF-2 and a pair of F-A-18C Hornets from VF-A-137 are approaching their target, the Iraqi Ministry of Defense's radio relay transmitter at Salman Pak a heavily defended town southeast of Baghdad. The missions over Baghdad tonight are the first non-stealth attacks against a target in the Baghdad area since the ill-fated Package Q debacle in the First Gulf War. Lieutenant Commander Kurt Frankenberger is piloting the lead Tomcat and immediately loses count of the number of SAM launches against the formation, recalling, We had to trust our systems and visually confirm that each missile did not appear to be tracking then disregard it and evaluate the next one. Jesus. Four F-16 wild weasels are covering the strike formation and launch their harms from behind them, knocking out enemy SAMs when they dare to illuminate their fire control radars. The enemy fire intensifies as the Tomcats and Hornets draw closer to the radio transmitter. However, the radio intercept officer in the other F-14 is unbothered by the heavy AA fire and is filming the entire bombing run with a home camcorder. What? He's just there record or they're just there recording it. This is wild to me that like there's it's obviously not a force with it. It's like there's a fi a force field around each individual aircraft because they're just so there's so many things that just protect it from being hit. It's so fascinating to me that they can just have signal and all this kind of stuff and like just whatever it is that stops them from being hit they can sort of create that thing. It is literally like a, a force field, in a sense, to be honest. Frankenberger remembers. He took some great video footage, documenting the target ingress as if he was going to Disneyland. <laughs> Once they reach the release point, the Hornets and Tomcats release their JDAMs and turn to leave the area. Disneyland, Jesus. The radio transmitter is destroyed, and Frankenberger and three others will be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for their excellent performance. Lovely. This is also the first time an F-14 Tomcat has dropped a JDAM in combat. One section of F-14Ds from VF-2 is diving in on the heavily defended al Takadum airbase to the west of Baghdad. The Tomcats drop five JDAMs which crater the runway, making the base inoperable to the enemy. Two more VF-2 F-14s are tasked with providing air cover for the other Tomcats, but the Iraqi Air Force continues to remain on the ground. The bombing continues throughout the night and into the early morning hours of the 22nd of March. Four F-A-18Cs and two F-14s from the USS Abraham Lincoln strike a missile production facility in Karbala. The Tomcats dive in fast, releasing four 2,000-pound JDAMs. Three minutes later, the Hornets follow and drop a mix of JDAMs and Mark 84 bombs. The Iraqis launch several SAMs at the aircraft, but none track, and they make it back to the Abraham Lincoln without further incident. Two wings of tornadoes from RAF-12 Squadron are heading straight into the teeth of the Supermares. The first Super wing of eight tornadoes smash Iraqi... So this is, I guess, where it's very, very... I mean, it's all dangerous, right? But this is where it's even higher risk situations. ...radar sites near the northern city of Mosul with their alarm missiles losing no aircraft in the process. Damn. The second wing of seven tornadoes is commanded by squadron leader Kev Rumans. Their task is to destroy the Republican Guard barracks in the heavily defended town at Saribadi, 30 miles southwest of Baghdad. To minimize exposure to Iraqi anti-aircraft systems, 
Rumans lead the tornadoes in line abreast, so they can each fire two alarm missiles once enemy SAM radars light up, while simultaneously dropping Paveway 2 laser-guided bombs on the barracks. With the sun starting to appear on the horizon, the tornadoes launch their alarms while unleashing all 21 of their paveways on the target within a two-second window. With so many missiles and bombs in the air, Rumans later says, I remember thinking to myself that it looked like a scene out of the movie Armageddon. The tornadoes beat a hasty retreat to avoid SAM launches, but satellite imagery later confirms the paveways have scored 21 direct hits on the Republican Guard barracks. With the sun now rising over Baghdad, the first night of A-Day is over and the remaining strike aircraft egress back to their bases. They are soon replaced by Hornets and A-10 Warthogs, along with US Marine and RAF Harriers, which arrive so to provide boys. close air support for the ground forces advancing further into Iraq. The big boys. Much like its predecessor 12 years earlier, the first night of the air war over Iraq is a success. In some respects, it is an operational improvement, as no coalition aircraft are shot down. This is mostly due to weaker-than-expected Iraqi resistance. Furthermore, Major Iraqi airfields are rendered unusable by JDAM and Storm Shadow strikes, knocking the Iraqi Air Force out of the war in the first few hours. In contrast to the Desert Storm Air War, the Iraqi Air Force does not take to the skies during the entire campaign. When asked by the press why the Iraqi Air Force will not come out to fight, General Mosley responds, I believe that he has not flown because in their mind they've made a calculation that they will not survive. For the rest of Operation Iraqi Freedom, the main focus of the coalition's air power will be to provide close air support to ground troops as they advance northwest. Michael Knight, a British defence analyst, will later observe, in contrast to the beginning of Operation Desert Storm, which had been a triumph of orchestration, the opening of Operation Iraqi Freedom would prove to be a triumph of improvisation. Despite radical changes made to the plan in the hours before the attack, the air offensive smashes Iraqi defences to bits. A-Day is such a complete success in neutralising enemy air defences that the non-stealth B-1B bombers are able to fly daytime missions over the Supermez by the third day of the campaign. The coalition ground forces will enjoy unrivaled air superiority as they advance northwest. However, the air campaign does not deliver a strategic knockout blow as hoped. The decision to remove key regime targets from the list at the last minute spares much of Saddam's military capability. Unlike Desert Storm, his forces will continue to fight hard against the advancing coalition forces. Thanks again to Well, there we go then. I mean, we're going to see more about it. Um, wait, re-upload with a small correction would be massively helpful if you enjoy this video to perform a comment. You, Montemayor, and Kings and Generals are perhaps... I've never seen Kings and Generals. Are perhaps my favourite top channels for military engagements and history. Maybe we've got to check it out. But um, there we go. And so far, so good. It's not looking like anything's gone wrong. There's been a small like, things going wrong here and there, but it's not actually led to any, like, hits or anything. So, I mean, at this point in time, it was, it was going as well as possible. So I'm fascinated to see where it went from here because I'm still like unsure of how it did go because I, I I know about this war in my time but I don't know much about how it actually went. But um yeah that's the part one of the air war. Let me know your thoughts on this. Um if you were someone who was involved in this I guess let me know. I don't know the chances of that but yeah that's it for now. Until next time like subscribe and peace.